be speaking on how can literature fill in the silences of history. And the following week, we will have the three-part Huggins Lecture Series del um, delivered by Glenda Gilmore, and she will speak on Romare Bearden, A Life in Art. Now, please welcome to the podium Elizabeth Hinton, Professor of History and of African and African American Studies here at Harvard. Thank you for that introduction, Krishna, and good afternoon, everyone. It is my great honor to introduce Cassie Pittman Clater at the Du Bois Institute Fellows Colloquium today. Cassie is Assistant Professor of Sociology at Case Western Reserve University. As an undergraduate at the University of Pennsylvania, she did a double major in urban studies and sociology, and then she went on to earn a PhD in sociology and public policy here at Harvard, working with um, William Julius Wilson and Michelle Lamont. In her research and writing, Cassie examines the underlying social and cultural processes that affect African Americans' economic behavior. Utilizing qualitative methods, her work focuses on lived experiences of African American consumers. She has investigated African Americans' experiences in the consumer market, as well as the mortgage market. Incredibly important topic. She has published research examining black uh, consumers' experiences of retail racism and also on blacks' perceptions of social mobility and racial progress after the election of President Barack Obama. So basically everything, uh, the mo some of the most pressing issues that black Americans are facing. Life experiences have shaped Cassie's academic interests. As a child growing up in Cleveland, she shifted from an urban, all-black elementary school to a mainly white, elite private school. Her family and other social circumstances led people in the first school to believe that she was well-to-do. The opposite perception, not surprisingly maybe, was dominant in the second school. Dr. Clater learned early on that, quote, a person's social background can be more influential than their individual abilities or capacities in determining their opportunities and outcomes in life. As a result, she was compelled to explore disparities in social status as well as the so-called American dream as a myth. Her current book project, tentatively titled Black Privilege and Black Power, paints a picture of the everyday lives of middle class African Americans, revealing how both race and class impact their reality and inform their consumption preferences as displayed at work, in their neighborhoods, and at sites of leisure. Black Privilege offers original analysis as to what middle class status buys blacks who have cultural capital, credentials, and cash on hand, and it documents how for middle class blacks, economic life, economic transactions, and market relations are affected by race in ways that have not been accounted for to date. Only a few years after earning her doctorate, Cassie Pittman Clater is a well-established scholar of race and opportunity. She is the author of articles in, a significant, in significant publications in her field. Among many honors, she has received a Woodrow Wilson Foundation's Early Career Enhancement Fellowship, a Glennon Fellowship from Case Western Reserve, and a research grant from the university's Social Justice Institute. In forthcoming work, Cassie documents the lack of research on African American consumers in the top marketing journals. She also began a research project that examines the way that race, class, and lifestyle preferences inform considerations of neighborhood desirability, focusing specifically on the residents of a predominantly black middle class neighborhood in Cleveland, which she is fortunate enough to call her hometown. Please join me in welcoming Cassie to the stage. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Be great. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Hinton. That was like such a wonderful introduction, and I feel like it was so personalized. I really appreciate it. Um, as is our sort of ritual, I would like to thank everyone at the Hutchins uh, Center, Professor Gates, Krishna, and also all the staff, and of course my colleagues, the uh, Du Bois Institute Fellows. Um, so in today's talk, I would like to present some uh, material that will be featured in my upcoming book, which is tentatively titled Black Privilege and Black Power. Um, so I'm, my goal is really to do two things. First, I will sort of elaborate on a concept which is sort of central to the book, um, that of black privilege. And um, so this is a concept that emerged from my analysis of people's experiences across these different social domains. So as I like to say, um, from the workplace to the neighborhood to also sites of leisure. So as they navigate these domains, um, how they experience race and class, um, I think is best articulated in a way in which they are both privileged by race, privileged by class, but also 
encounter uh, stigma that is sort of uh, disadvantaged that they experience because of their race. So I want to kind of um, illustrate this concept with a case uh, that I will elaborate in, in some detail. Second, my goal today is to present some evidence of some sort of new analysis that I've, I've done to try to demonstrate the way that middle class blacks um, maintain a collective orientation. Now, now, not all middle class blacks, but a sizable sample of blacks in my sample indicated that they believed it was important to buy black. And so I'll flesh out how, um, and subscribe into this um, idea of buying black, um, their race is conditioning their economic preferences, right? So they're not just self-interested actors, but their position as a member of, of a racial group arguably is influencing how they think about their engagement in the market, which goes against a lot of the logic of, um, which, which, which uh, emphasizes sort of like the rational actor who's self-interested, right? So I, I'm arguing that race plays a particular role influencing consumer behavior. Um, so before I start, I just want to briefly note my methods. Um, so this research was based out of uh, a study that I conducted in New York City. It's a qualitative research study, and I define middle class blacks as those who are college educated, and I also use occupation as a criteria to determine their class status. And the reason why I do this is because when we think about individuals' cultural tastes and their preferences, they're much more aligned to level of education than they are necessarily to income. And also, in terms of how people self-identify, um, which is also sort of tends to be more consistent uh, related to both education and um, also occupation. So occupational attainment and educational attainment are what I use to define individuals who are a part of the black middle class. And arguably the black middle class today is a beneficiary of uh, civil rights, uh, achievements of the civil rights movement, and they are granted a number of sort of opportunities and privileges that black middle class in previous um, you know, periods weren't necessarily, uh, weren't available to blacks in previous periods. So I want to start by a discussion about the role of consumption. So why study consumption? Well, arguably, not only is consumption essential and a part of our sort of everyday lives, consumption is also a social activity and it's intricately tied to our social identities. Um, in thinking about blacks' relationship with consumption, arguably, uh, blacks have historically fought for full inclusion in the consumer sphere, right? So part of the reason why so many of the sort of civil rights protests, the civil rights movement focused on um, boycotting stores, movie theaters, and other spaces of public and commercial um, establishments was because um, there's a pervasive idea in American society more broadly that um, consumers should be entitled to equal treatment for equal dollars, right? So uh, we live in a mass uh, consumer society and this idea that everyone should be able to buy without conflict whatever it is they desire, as long as they have access to economic resources, is one that blacks have historically not necessarily experienced. They've often experienced exclusion in these commercial spheres, and arguably looking at or examining their consumption is one way to sort of explore if they've been able to achieve full inclusion. Are they treated as equals? Um, and what I argue is that, in fact, middle class blacks they have all these credentials, they have cash on hand, but if we look at their consumption, we can kind of see that they still have to confront racial disadvantage and also racial stigma. And one sphere that they encounter that is in the, in the sort of retail settings, but it's also in their workplaces and other interactions in other sort of social spheres as well. So I want to start off with the story of one particular respondent and arguably, she's not sort of representative of all members of the black middle class, but I think she helps to elucidate this idea that the black middle class experience is different and distinct, both from the black poor and working class, but also from the black, I mean, from the white middle class. She, in some sense, embodies this concept of black privilege, which I really want to sort of elucidate today. <laughs> 
So Tasha uh, was a lawyer living in New York, and we met up at this sort of trendy um, Ethiopian-Italian fusion restaurant, which was very emblematic, I think, of her sort of taste for both trendy and, and sort of the finer things. Um, and after we sort of got over a few introductory questions, I asked her about her encounters with racial stereotypes. And without hesitation, she, saw, um, she revealed to me that she frequently encounters whites who assume that she grew up poor in a rough part of town and was raised by a single mother, of course, who was on welfare. And sh this, could be, um, this couldn't be further from her actual experience. So this, was, this sort of status mis misrecognition was a sort of racial stereotype that she felt like she encountered quite frequently. Um, and she said, you know, not only um, I was raised in a two-parent home and a cul-de-sac, my parents are educated and professional. In fact, Tasha, who was a proud Rattler, um, a graduate of FAMU, and she was a third generation college graduate. Um, but she still encountered this, this stereotype that she must have grown up poor. So even though she has um, been quite successful in terms of her career. She has, um, she attended FAM and she also attended an elite Ivy League school, so she has these sort of credentials. Um, and she was also quite confident, but she still had to encounter sort of negative re perceptions of her race. Um, but nonetheless, she loved being black. She says she loves her skin, she loves her hair, and she loves a rich culture of her people. She believed that African Americans were some of the most resilient people on earth, and this was important in shaping her decision about where to live when she moved to New York. So she chose to live in Harlem, and part of the reason why was because she saw this as iconic black neighborhood, which conveyed a certain level of racial symbolism. So I should say that this research was done in 2009, and if you go to Harlem today, there's a lot more going on, there's a lot of shifts, and it would be interesting to even follow up to see how people's perceptions of the neighborhood's iconic racial status might have changed. But at the time, um, this was you know, very salient uh, among folks who lived in the neighborhood. They talked about it having um, a reputation as being a sort of node of black cultural life. Um, so she says, you know, I really love living here. I love living in a black neighborhood. I love going to C-Town, which is a local grocery store chain, and they're playing Beyonce and songs that I like, songs that I can sing along to, and I just feel a sense of, I don't know, pride, because there's so much history here. When I walk down 125th Street, I'm like, this is one of those streets that everybody knows. Nationwide, if you're black, you've heard of 125th Street. You've heard of Sylvia's Soul Food, and that's around the corner from my house. And the Apollo Theater, that's around the corner from my house. So those kinds of things. I, I love the spirit of it all. When Obama was elected, um, there was a party in the streets, and we were playing drums, and it was so much fun. And when Michael Jackson died, people were partying, literally celebrating his life in front of the Apollo Theater. So Tasha sees living in a majority black neighborhood as having positive qualities, both cultural and social amenities, which make it a desirable place to live. Um, she valued having opportunities to celebrate black cultural life in her everyday, um, everyday life, and she also likes living near her church. So she grew up attending a bo um, a both African ep Methodist Episcopal churches and black Baptist churches. Um, and when she was sort of, when she was raised, she went to Sunday school every Sunday. She was a member of the Junior Usher Board and the Gospel Choir. And so now, as an adult, this idea of being near your church was still something that was, was important to her. Um, and even though she doesn't go to church as frequently now, she does like to, as she says, get churched out every now and again, by which she meant dressing up in what she called a Michelle Obama suit, which was, she said, a dress with a matching cropped jacket and matching pumps. Um, so sh this was you know, something she, she uh, saw black spaces, cultural institutions like the black church as a place where um, there was pleasure to be had, right? There was um, kinship to be had. 
Um, and she also talks about living in a black neighborhood as having a distinct social interactional climate. So she talks about um, the way people engage on the street with one another and how that is different than arguably in other neighborhoods. So she says, it's just that soul that you don't get anywhere else. There's community. There's a man who plays the Casio keyboard on Linux, right up the street, Linux between 126 and 125th. And every day he says, good morning to me, every day. In Chelsea, the bums wouldn't speak to me. I just feel like there's a sense of community, even though it's like the doctor and the drug dealer, but they both know each other and, that's, and they say what's up when they pass on their way to wherever they're going. So Tassa is suggesting that there's a sense of shared understanding which is displayed in people's daily interactions in majority black neighborhoods. Um, and these interactions, interestingly, um, transcend class. Right? There's, so she argues, you know, there's this socioeconomic difference, but people are still able to at least acknowledge and recognize one another. Um, and this is one of the, this sort of acknowledgement of one another is one of the things that she talks about is a central benefit that is a part of her experience of living in a black neighborhood. Um, however, like other middle class blacks, uh, there definitely were trade-offs that came from engaging in this race-based preference, right? So she enjoys all these racial aspects of her interactions, uh, the celebratory nature of black culture that existed in black neighborhoods, but there were definitely were these trade-offs. And one of the things that Tasha complained about was there were no Thai restaurants and that, you know, there was this really poor quality of grocery store meat, you know, that there's this, you know, this idea that, um, that there just wasn't a lot of organic options, right? So um, in living in this black neighborhood, it was definitely a, a means of sort of expressing her racialized preferences, but it meant that her class-based preferences were often restricted. And this was something that uh, members of, in, people I interviewed who lived in black neighborhoods harped on often, that they were, they were bereft of basic amenities uh, one uh, guy said, you know, I can't get a chicken Caesar salad. It's nothing but fried foods. Um, other people talked about um, he couldn't shop in his neighborhood unless he wanted to get a white tee to wear to a barber shop, I mean to a barbecue, that there was no place, there was no men's warehouses. So this idea that there, they weren't places that they can necessarily satisfy their class-based preferences, but there were places that allowed them to express this sort of um, collective orientation and, and a, a desire a warm regard for other blacks. Okay, so I know this is a long example, but it's because I, I do think she's um, illustrative of, of this concept. So when, when Tasha leaves her neighborhood and goes to work, she leaves a community where she feels that black culture is celebrated, where she's included and she's connected to those who live around her, and she goes to a workplace where she's the only black woman at her firm. There's another black woman at the company but she works in the Chicago office. Okay, so um, she's a, essentially a racial token. Um, and so at work, um, she talks about how she feels that she has to always appear and present herself in a way that can be taken seriously and that um, her competence is always important to emphasize. Um, and she says this because as being a black woman, I'm careful because I don't want um, she says, I'm careful because I don't want to be the one to keep them from never hiring another black girl. I want them to be like, she was fabulous. She was great. We are so sorry to see her go because for me, at least in the back of my mind, you never know how much their perception of you is based on you as a person or judgment based on your skin, your skin color. So for Tasha, grooming and her regimen of sort of self-maintenance and also the fact that she was sort of an avid consumer was part of gaining acceptance or appearing culturally similar and being very careful about her management of race at work. Um, she, f she felt that she was a representative of her race and this was something that was also commonly emphasized among respondents. So one respondent, Jeff, he talks about how he essentially equates himself to the modern Jackie Robinson. Um, and he says, you know, um, when you look at Jackie Robinson, he says, quote, 
if Jackie Robinson was spitting at people who were calling him the N-word, throwing stuff, getting mad at press conferences after the game, yeah, they would have been like, shut it down, no more. But he had to be quiet. He had to take the hits. He had to be docile and be like, okay. So, yeah. So they would say, yeah, look, they're not that bad. Let them in. So Jeff basically equates himself to integrating a workplace where blacks are not the norm, and as a consequence, he feels it's important to really manage how others perceive him. And this was something that Tasha also did. Um, and um, Tasha um, went to the hair stylist every two weeks on a precise schedule, and sometimes she went once a week. Um, and visiting a sort of black beauty salon so frequently was something that she began doing as a child. Um, and so much so that she said that she really wouldn't feel like herself if her hair wasn't done. So um, this sort of management of self was something that was important to her. It was sort of a, a ritual that she learned and grown up with, but it was also a part of her strategy of navigating a majority white uh, workplace. Um, and when we think about hair, um, hairstyles are important racial markers. They can embody racial difference and they can also be arguably adapted, adapted to indicate conformity. So the management of hair and personal grooming, um, particularly for middle class blacks in these majority white workplaces, so this was something that was not found among blacks who were in majority black workplaces. They were not concerned about the obsessive management of hair. And I should note, too, that um, a lot of black professional men talked about getting their hair cut uh, very frequently, not even uh, once a week, but every five days, um, so that their hair was always clean shaven. So it wasn't just something that women did. But this idea of sort of looking put together was uh, part of their sort of black middle class positionality. And um, it was also part of managing racial stigma. So Vanessa. Um, was uh, very explicit about this. And she said, you know, um, my clients very well may not have had a black person working for them that's not their assistant or not the janitor or whatever. They don't see black people out in the places they shop and they don't see them out on the street. They just don't see black people. And if I'm the only black person that you see and it's going to make you feel more comfortable with me if my hair is straight, it's really nothing you can do. We're talking about client-based engagements. This is money. If you're my client and you need me to look a certain way, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. I can straighten this, she pointed to her head. How straight do you want it? So this idea of managing their self-presentation uh, in, in their effort to be perceived positively uh, by non-black coworkers particularly as Vanessa emphasized, when dealing with clients who are, you know, you have to cater to the desires of clients, was one of the ways in which their consumption, so getting their hair done frequently, was impacted by not their own personal preferences. So when I interviewed Vanessa, she had her hair in a natural hairstyle, but it was a part of their sort of strategies of managing racial stigma. And so when we think about Tasha, in many instances, her racial self-concept and the way she manages race in her daily life is a product of both her experiences in black spaces, but also in her experiences in white spaces, in white spaces particularly when she's dealing with perceptions of black culture or black practices that might not be, uh, that might not value black uh, culture. So this is something um, that she had encountered very early on in her life um, and um, she described an incident at uh, her predominantly white Montessori school where all the kids assumed um, that um, every other black person in the school was her older sister. So she, you know, as, as a child, she recognized that race was impacting her experience differently in these white settings, and it was something that she continually dealt with. And so one um, sort of another, another sort of instance in where race matters in Tasha's sort of everyday life is when she's shopping. And so Tasha was an avid consumer. Um, and she talked about how she managed race in, in retail settings. Um, and um, one of the things that she said she did was 
you know, um, she faithfully shopped at Saks. So rather than go to Chanel to get a Chanel bag, she would buy a Chanel bag at Saks because she had a Saks card. And she hoped that her sort of long-standing purchase history would demonstrate her worth as a loyal customer. And so if she ever encountered any sort of negative uh, experience because of her race or any service failure, she would have a lengthy history um, to demonstrate that she should be valued and such behavior shouldn't be tolerated. Um, and so in, in encounters with retail racism, blacks adopt lots of different strategies. This was just one of them. But um, in general, they reported responding to two salient stereotypes. The first is that blacks were likely to be thieves or shoplifters, which um, connotates this association with blacks with criminality. And the second was that blacks were just too poor to be able to shop in a particular place where they were shopping. So being told the price of things before they ask, being told to go to the sales section, or, oh, you know, the sales section is in the back. And in some cases, people explicitly saying, like, you know you can't afford this, right? So these are the types of experiences that they encountered in shopping. Um, and interestingly, um, so they, oftentimes they shopped in some of these high-end stores, like Jeff, he describes his wardrobe as a Brooks Brothers catalog because they want to appear like a Jackie Robinson at work. Right? They want to demonstrate their competence. They want to demonstrate their cultural similarity. But in doing so, they're still managing racial stigma in the retail setting. So to the concept of black privilege. Um, again, Tasha's experience is not, um, I don't use Tasha as an example to say her experience is like every other middle class black person. But I think it is illustrative of a commonality that I found among my respondents uh, which I denote with the concept of black privilege. So black privilege arguably has two sort of dimensions. The first is that they're dealing with being simultaneously a part of a racially disadvantaged group and an economically advantaged group. So they enjoy a lot of life's luxuries, they're dining out, they're attending cultural events, they're buy, buying organic produce, shopping at high-end stores, taking international vacations, they're able to save and invest. Um, as some people like to say, they're working at securing the bag, right? Um, <laughs> that's a DJ Khaled quote, but nonetheless. So, um, but at the same time, they're faced with stereotypes that indicate status misrecognition. They are also dealing with contexts in which black culture is either unknown or devalued, right? So their sort of paradoxical position, I think, is shared irrespective of whether or not in all instances they indicate a preference for sort of black cultural aesthetics or black culture social spaces, right? They're dealing with these two, um, these two sort of conflicting positions. And arguably that privileges, the economic privileges really separate them from the black poor, right? And even the black working class. But at the same time, the racial uh, experiences separate them from the white middle class, right? So having money, having elite credentials, it definitely improves um, their sort of position. They're able to achieve a modicum of what we might say the good life. But it's not equivalent to uh, white middle class folks. Um, but at the same time, they're able to participate and they oftentimes talk about their sort of feeling of pride and inclusion with uh, other blacks. So they also have uh, the benefit of their sort of racial position is that they are a part of this larger black collective. So the second sort of dimension of black privilege is having the ability to know when to engage different aspects of your sort of cultural repertoires, right? So you have exposure and lived experience in different types of social contexts, um, and you have arguably a great deal of diverse cultural knowledge, but you have to know in which instances to display what type of, of um, what type of cultural preferences or practices to display. So uh, whether 
you can think about this in terms of hairstyle, um, styles of dress, or music. People are negotiating all these things and across these different social domains. Okay. So the second part of my talk today, I want to focus on thinking about the ways in which middle class blacks are subscribing to certain cultural belief systems that are racially specific, which also then inform their consumption. So moving away from the concept of black privilege, but thinking about how race conditions their consumption. So in many ways, um, ideologies are important in informing our behavior, whether it be political behavior or economic behavior or, or cultural tastes and preferences. Um, and ideologies are arguably sort of explicit meaning systems, which then provide us with guidelines or templates for behavior. Um, and arguably, ideologies have been um, articulated with a specific goal, usually to achieve some form of social gain. So in thinking about ideologies that are race specific, one of perhaps the most prolific and persistent ideologies within African American um, life has been the ideology of black nationalism. So African American scholars, intellectuals, politicians, spokespeople have articulated various versions of black nationalism and arguably one of the sort of central tenets of black nationalism has been calls for self-determination and um, self-reliance. And that has arguably specific um, economic consequences. So in thinking about Du Bois, so Du Bois and Marcus Garvey are arguably two, or have been argued to be very different in terms of the types of solutions that they propose for the advancement of African Americans. But both Du Bois and Garvey argued for the importance of sort of black economic independence. So, so Du Bois um, promoted this idea of cooperative economics, right? And he thought that um, if blacks were able to develop a cooperative economy, they could dramatically reduce their dependence on whites and also alleviate problems like unemployment that plagued the black community. Um, and Marcus Garvey argued uh, similarly that um, group empowerment could result from economic um, development, but also racial pride and, and social separation. So Garveyites throughout the 1940s and 50s elaborated um, and encouraged other blacks to buy black. They advocated for black consumers to use their purchasing power as a way of achieving independence and also of improving the current state of affairs in the black community. Now arguably um, in the 60s, uh, Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X were um, proponents of this idea of black economic nationalism, which um, in a speech in Detroit, Malcolm X says, you know, the ph economic philosophy of black nationalism only means that we should own and operate and control the economy of our, in our community. So in, in many ways, they argued that it was important for black consumers to have a sense of solidarity in their spending, and that this was something that could result in eliminating some of the problems that the black community faced um, and it would also result in independence from whites and control over economic resources. So arguably these are sort of some of the historical um, scholars and intellectuals and public intellectuals who've promoted, who's promoted this idea of the importance of buying black, but these are very much salient still today um, and these are some examples of this idea of buying black as sort of continually influencing discussions about racial advancement for African Americans. So one example is the Ebony Experiment, which was um, conducted by a black family in 2009 in Chicago, and they were committed to spending their money only at black owned businesses for an entire year. And Maggie Anderson described this as her family's efforts to do her part to solve the crisis in the black community as she explained buying black was the best way to demonstrate your love and pride for your community. In 2006, during a town hall meeting, rap artist Killer Mike challenged one million blacks to deposit $100 into black banks, launching the black bank, ch buy bank black 
challenge. Uh, and most recently, in a GQ article, Sean Brotherlove Combs uh, talked about a collaboration he has with rapper Jay-Z, um, where he hopes to design an app that will help locate black-owned businesses and what he calls black-friendly businesses. Um, and he says, this is his way of, of explaining it, you know, the app will make it possible for us to have economic community. It's about blacks gaining economic power. At some point, there has to be some kind of fight. I feel like we've done a lot of marching. It's time to start charging. So Combs is essentially indicating this idea, which again is a remnant from other ideas of the past, that through blacks' purchasing power and patronage of black-owned and black-friendly businesses, we could arguably change the state of affairs in the black communities, right? So uh, we need to try different means of achieving, um, other than marching and political protests, we need to think about economic community. So this is a salient ideological uh, belief system, or you could say political belief system with economic ramifications. And I was curious to see what extent was this salient among uh, middle class blacks who I interviewed. And what I found was nearly two thirds um, basically endorsed this idea as being a very important way of, of, of um, achieving uh, racial advancement, right? So um, they really subscribed to this idea and they articulated a lot of these sort of tenets of this uh, of economic control, community uplift, helping out um, fellow brethren. Um, they were very collectively oriented in terms of justifying their decisions to buy black. There was also a third of the sample who basically did not subscribe to this idea and rather articulated market logics that emphasized their self-interest and the idea that the marketplace was a place where the qualities of products uh, and the quality of service should dictate whether or not um, it deserved their sort of dollar. So those are two competing um, sort of views, but for the most, the large segment of the sample, they in some instance demonstrated sympathies, if not subscribing holistically, this sort of uh, argument about black economic nationalism. Okay, so in, I asked them about the types of black businesses they supported, and interestingly enough, most were restaurants, um, and um, um, so it was not real a huge breadth, uh, but there were different types of black owned businesses which they supported. So in terms of the sort of logics that they use, they emphasize their relationship to other blacks to justify this decision to support black owned businesses. So one example of this was a guy, Wayne, and when I asked him, you know, do you ever try to, you know, uh, buy black, he said, hell yeah. And I said, okay, well, why is that something that is important to you? And he said he really liked the idea of putting money in other black people's pockets, that it was important to him to be able to help another black person provide for their families. Similarly, Erica talked about um, if she had a choice between a black owned store and one that was not, that she would privilege the black owned store because she thought it was contributing to the economic well being of other blacks. And that, as she noted, I would be directly supporting black people and their income earning potential. Um, individuals also articulated this idea of economic control. So Lance talked about how important it was to support black owned businesses because if you didn't do your part, then we can't really complain about all the businesses in our community being owned by whites. So he said, um, if I don't help and nobody else helps, we out of business. We're back to where we were before where only the white folks are owning everything. I can't complain about black folks that own anything if we black folks own something and I don't support it. So again, this sort of emphasizes this idea of economic control. And then again, was this idea of community uplift. So that through their purchasing power, they could arguably improve the conditions in black neighborhoods. They could fuel economic development. So Brittany talks about this. She says, you know, economics and money fuel the rest of the world. And so if you invest your dollar in your community, 
You create more resources and amenities for your communities, which make it more enjoyable place to live. So similarly, Ashley, who worked in human resources, talked about how it's good to keep your money in your community because I feel that's the best way for us to thrive if we support each other with our dollars. So this idea that the community would benefit, that there would be community uplift or community improvement if blacks had economic solidarity was also something that was raised by respondents. And they even um, and sometimes lamented it at the fact that black neighborhoods were so downtrodden and they attributed this uh, to this idea that blacks lack financial solidarity and they often noted that Jewish people support Jewish people and Chinese people support Chinese people. Those are common um, comparative cases. And that within the black community, we've had a history of not supporting our own businesses and that this was, um, you know, arguably this was something that was lamentable. Um, so not only is it a, a means to uplift the community, but not keeping money within the black community was seen as a way of, of perpetuating the problem. Okay, so um, one of the other reasons that were sort of uh, the sort of logics, racial logics that were used to justify this idea that it's important to buy black was the idea that black business owners were selling products or services that were racially specific. And that if we didn't support black owned businesses, and you can think about this broadly, because they also talked about the idea of supporting black cultural producers like film directors, that was very common how important it is to go support black films, um, but that then there, weren't, there wouldn't be opportunities or the black community's specific needs wouldn't be met. So Jada talked about this in relationship to makeup. And she worked um, professionally as a marketing manager, but she also had a side hustle. She did hair and makeup. And she talked about how important it is to support black businesses because they really have an understanding of our community and our culture. So in her own entrepreneurial efforts, she says, you know, she really tries to look out for makeup that works for her complexion because she knows it will work for her black clients. Um, and she says, you know, I love doing makeup for black women, but I'm not exclusive. So she was sure to emphasize that, you know, she also sought other clients. Um, trust me, I have skills to do anyone's hair or makeup, but there's something special about doing uh, about being the same. Like, I understand what you need because I share a lot of your needs. And I try to keep abreast of what my black clients need so that kind of spills over into that. And I try to patronize black businesses because at the end of the day, this is our community, this is our culture. Um, so this was a, a different sort of narrative argument about how important it is to sustain black businesses because they are uh, cultural producers that are able to accommodate and, and cater to the needs uh, that are specific to um, black consumers. So interestingly enough, even those who did not explicitly um, um, endorse the idea of the importance of buying black, they still, in their actual consumer practices, often sought out black uh, businesses, black entrepreneurs, when it came to sort of racially specific cultural products, among uh, which uh, most salient was going to a black barber or a black hairstylist. So uh, one guy, when I asked him about, you know, is this important to you? He says, no, no, I really, I really only shop at like exclusive places for my clothes. Um, but in another part of the interview, he talked about how he wouldn't like to live in anywhere where he couldn't get good access to a barbershop. That basically, if he lived anywhere else in New York, if he didn't live in, in Brooklyn or Harlem, he would have to go to Brooklyn or Harlem to get his hair cut. And since he got his hair cut so frequently, that would be something that would become inconvenient for him. So even though um, arguably um, he didn't it endorse his idea of buying black is important, in some of his consumption, he still supported black-owned businesses and entrepreneurs because arguably they provided a racially specific or unique product. But there were also others who articulated market logics. They were about a third of the sample. And Patrick was one example of them. And he talked about the iPhone. He says, you know, I'm more focused on the product itself. Like, you know, the iPhone. Does anyone care if a white man is the CEO of Apple? You know, nobody cares. They just love the iPhone. 
basically because of how it operates and what it does, and it does everything that they want, so they buy it. And he says, I'm that kind of person. So for Patrick, um, he sees himself as a sort of a rational actor whose preferences don't and shouldn't even take into consideration racial considerations. The market for him is not a place to demonstrate any sort of racial allegiances or loyalties, but rather it's a place or sphere for him to sort of satisfy his own sort of self-interest. So this ideology of buying black, which arguably is a, a segment or derivative of a, of a larger black nationalist project, was meaningful for some blacks. Um, and um, in the practice of supporting black owned businesses was something that almost all engaged in, even if they didn't explicitly endorse the larger ideology. So in summary, when we think about black middle class blacks as consumers, in many ways they are integrated into a system of mass consumption um, in which they hope to utilize their economic power for their own benefit but also to the benefit of the black collective. And in that sense, their race and also in some cases racialized ideologies are important in impacting their preferences. It separates them from other consumers um, but it also, um, so it separates them from middle class whites, but it also in some sense can connect them to the larger um, black public. So when we think about their rationales in supporting black owned businesses, they might draw on sort of varied rhetoric, but they share this common goal of advancing the race and they believe in the importance of sort of economic opportunities and purchasing power um, as something that um, can help improve the situation of other blacks. So what did I want you to take away from this talk today? Well, two things. First, when we think about middle class blacks, it's important to emphasize that they're not a homogeneous market segment, but there are things that arguably unite them and might impact their consumption. So first is the idea that they have experiences that are indicative of their black privilege, which arguably condition their consumption. So navigating race and racial stigma, uh, navigating social circumstances that have different social requirements, then has implications on their engagement in the market. Second, they also, in some instances, illustrate commitments to, to, or to race specific ideologies and that also importantly conditions their consumption. So when we think about the consumer marketplace, it's not a place that's race neutral, but it's often imbued in the decisions that African Americans make as consumers. Um, and I think oh, maybe one other slightly important takeaway is when we think about American society is moving towards an increasingly my, uh, uh, majority minority nation. So when we think about it as a consumption society, a consumer society, and we think about mass consumption, I do think it's important for us to contemplate how role, race and cultural preferences are going to be manifested in the market, um, which um, you know, is not something that has sort of been thoroughly addressed. Um, so with that, I will conclude. Great, thank you. <laughs> One o'clock, 101. <laughs> you made it. Great, Cassie. That was wonderful. Elizabeth, would you like to start us off? Sure. Yes. Uh, that was a fantastic presentation. I have a lot of um, questions running through my mind, and one of them is kind of selfish. I guess uh, the first is so, how are you actually, are, are you actually talking about the black middle class, or are you talking about black elite? So, I'd love to just like mm -hmm. hear you talk some about what you consider the black middle class and if a vile a viable black middle class exists and how that might, how the black middle class might be, might be different than what we might consider the white middle class in part due to the really uh, gross wealth disparities between black mm -hmm. and white Americans in general. And then the other question is, so you talked, um, your, you know, your, your research is mostly among black prof business professionals and so I would just love to hear your thoughts mm -hmm. about the ways in which 
some of um, your analysis about tokenism and managing racial stigma applies to black academics uh -huh. and, and, and where black academics kind of fit into, are they part of this black middle class that you're talking about? Mm -hmm. And, um, and what, what is kind of unique of, about the black academic experience and what is kind of reflective of some of the larger processes that you're describing? Wonderful, thank you. So I think, okay, so when we think about the black middle class versus the black elite, the black elite is like so small that um, when you think about sort of social interaction, they c it's almost like they have to interact with other blacks because it, it's such a small community. And therefore there is some, um, and the black middle class in general is very bottom heavy, right? So that in itself differentiates it from uh, when we think about uh, the white middle class and the white elite, right? Because the black elite is so, 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 so small and the black middle class is so bottom heavy. Um, and I think that my respondent, so Tasha was sort of, um, you know, having grown up in a middle class home, and, um, you know, her experience was in some sense different from, uh, I have another example of a guy who basically grew up working class, but um, was sort of upwardly mobile, because she had a lot of familiarity with sort of uh, white elite culture, right? Uh, whereas he, he didn't. Um, so I do think that might be a part of the difference. When we think about privilege, class privilege being the sort of ease in which you can navigate different sort of circumstances or social contexts, uh, the more embedded you are in a sort of elite culture, um, arguably that facilitates this ease. Right. I mean, I, I, so if, if, I, if I use income as a criteria, she would probably be like maybe a part of the upper class. But I sort of um, cast my net in a bit more broader, expansive terms because otherwise my sample might be too narrow. Or, you know, I think that experiences are comparable enough and that in, in some sense this idea of black privilege, um, you know, is consistent whether or not you are the racial token making 170,000 or the racial token making 70,000. Uh, at a point which reinforces uh, the arguments you're making. Mm -hmm. So you say the, the black middle class is, is bottom heavy. Uh, that's true. But one way your study deals with that problem and minimizes it is that your sample consisted of black middle class respondents who had a college education. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm very pleased that you chose that instead of income. Mm -hmm. I okay. just thought I would come to your <laughs> Thank support. You. Um, and um, in terms of wealth disparities, so, you know, there was a recently, I think it was a Pew study that demonstrates like wealth disparities are astronomical and basically blacks have like negative worth. Um, and, um, so is wealth important in navigating their consumption? Um, arguably, it's, it is a factor, but I guess, um, I guess in some sense, uh, even those, you know, a lot of these people have a lot of college loan debt, but that doesn't stop them from living a good life. Um, they're traveling and they have had these experiences and I think that that shapes their perspective. So they might actually have negative worth, but they are operating in all white workplaces and they've had experiences throughout their education, educational lives and even their adult lives that have separated them arguably from the black poor. Right, they have traveled, they do eat at these fine restaurants, they go to the Schoenberg and they go to Broadway plays. That doesn't mean they don't have uh, a lot of debt, they might still have that. And that debt might be essentially a, a, a part of them being able to have a middle class existence, right? It facilitated it in some sense, so. I also think, if you look at the Pew Research, uh, 
It's based on median income when you're talking about wealth in general. Uh, the more recent uh, findings show that uh, the gap in wealth in the, in <coughs> in when you compare blacks and whites is really much higher for middle income mm -hmm. blacks and whites. And interestingly, the, the, the gap is closing among the poor. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> there has been a significant drop in wealth in terms of home ownerships among the white poor and very little change among black poor who, or black low income people I should say, uh, who, uh, who own uh, property. Just thought I'd throw that in. So I have uh, three uh, questions uh, that are somewhat uh, related. Uh, the first one uh, is interested in your findings that two-thirds of the people in your sample say they will buy black. One-third <coughs> says that they will focus on the quality of the products. That determines which stores uh, they frequent. Uh, were there any uh, characteristics that distinguish these, the, these two, two groups? That, that's the first question. Uh, the second question is, um, uh, to what extent uh, were you concerned that your respondents were telling you what they think mm -hmm. you want to hear? And how did you sort of phrase uh, the questions, uh, you know, with that in mind? Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe that wasn't one of your concerns, but I'm always worried about that when, mm -hmm. when we have these kinds of uh, interviews. Uh, and thirdly, as you pursue this interesting research, and I'm sure this is a part of your research agenda, uh, down the road you might consider having vignettes uh, that describe uh, situations that would probably minimize, to some extent, uh, the sort of bias responses. And so, for example, one vignette would say something like, uh, you have two stores, a black store, and then you have a white store, mm -hmm. and but you're assured of getting fresh fruits and vegetables and fresh meats mm -hmm. at the white store. Mm -hmm. You know, do you still buy black? I mean, that kind of situational, mm -hmm. uh, 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 situational uh, mm -hmm. thing that's captured in vignettes. Excellent questions. Thank you, Bill. So um, I'll address the last first. So when we think about consumption, we can think about consumption as these sort of preferences that we have. So I always like to say, I would prefer to drive a Tesla. Um, you know, and our preferences are informative and important. They indicate things about our tastes. Um, they indicate our cultural capital. And then there also are our actual practices. So like in real life, I might drive a Toyota Corolla, <laughs> right? So that's a reflection of constraints, conditions of the market, my own economic position. So our preferences and our practices may not necessarily align. In, the, in terms of um, the idea of supporting black-owned businesses, I think that is probably a case of that their preferences to buy black may not align to their practices of buying black. In part because, and, and I didn't talk about this today, but when we look at black-owned businesses, um, there are not a lot of black-owned businesses, and that's actually one of the findings of the Ebony experiment. Like, there was one black-owned grocery store in all of Chicago. Um, and um, we, only 4% of black-owned businesses have more than one employee. You know, so there's not a lot of black businesses that are going to cater to their varied consumption, taste preferences, and, um, but I do think it's important to indicate if race is even a criteria informing their preferences, right? Just like my preference to drive a Tesla might be informed about my concern for the environment, right? So I, I, I feel like it's, it's revealing the importance of race as a conditioning factor, even if in real life it doesn't affect or is not necessarily um, displayed in their practices. And I think there's, there's lots of other sort of um, parallels to this in terms of, um, you know, um, sometimes people's political behavior, you know, aren't necessarily aligned um, to their personal positions or things that might be advantageous for them. Um, 
And, in ter and I think the vignettes, you know, that's a, a lot of research in housing has done that, you know, with the show cart method of demonstrating, like, would you live in a neighborhood that has this many black neighbors? Or, uh, or this many white neighbors. And that is informative, but what we know is oftentimes people still live in neighborhoods that are very different than they would ideally like to live in. And that is a product of living a racially segregated world where their ideal neighborhood options don't exist. Um, so I think it's important to consider both, but I do think that would be an interesting way to sort of further hash out this idea of um, is it just an ideological commitment, or is it something that they actually, you know, is it, is it demonstrated in their actual practice? Um, in terms of interview effects, so interestingly, like research on black nationalism has indicated that interview effects matter. So blacks are less likely to admit to agreeing with black nationalist ideas or having black nationalist tend to, uh, sympathies if they believe the interviewer is white. So, you know, me being um, African American might have, maybe they felt um, that they had to, in some sense, indicate support for this idea, um, when in reality it may not be very important. And um, I actually did have one respondent who said, you know, if I didn't say that I supported black owned businesses, that'd be really bad, wouldn't it? Um, which is, again, um, but I do think even that's informative, right? So this idea that among other blacks, it's important to demonstrate some racial allegiance, and that might be indicative in this idea of supporting buying black, um, I think is also important. It may be that their subscription to this ideology is more about indicating um, their sense of being a part of this black, um, uh, black community, whether it be real or imagined. Um, is that it? Well, yeah, one of the characteristics of those who said they were by black Oh, yes. Yeah, so I'm still trying to hash that out. And I would say, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of times people said they did emphasize that it's difficult, to, it, that it's not always um, when you buy black or support a black owned businesses, they still want a high quality product. Um, and, um, but they do admit and sometimes, you know, they'll pay more to support a black owned business even if it's the same product, right? So that cost might necessarily be a deterrent. I'm still trying to hash out what are some of the differences. So one of the things that seems to be a pattern is college educated blacks who are in more like working class positions, like social workers. Um, or like I have an interviewee, he's um, a parole officer. And so this is just not as salient. And the other thing I'm trying to determine if this has an impact is uh, among my respondents who are second generation immigrants, like the child of African and Caribbean immigrants. So uh, one respondent, she talked about how she thought it was important to buy black. She was of Guyanan heritage. Her parents were immigrants from Ghana. And she said that this was something that she came to after living in a black neighborhood because now that she lives in a black neighborhood, she sees black businesses and she wants them to be successful. And that's a part of, um, she said it was, you know, she feels like there's pr she would be, um, she's proud of black businesses that are successful and she wants black businesses in her neighborhood to succeed. But that wasn't something that she ever really thought of uh, prior and most of her sort of experiences prior were in all white settings. So she grew up in a white community, she went to a white high school, she went to a majority white college, and her first real experience interacting on a large scale with other blacks was living in a black neighborhood. So it wasn't something that um, was highly salient among, to her arguably before. So. Is, is McDonald's a black owned business if it has, um, you know, the local franchise owner? in your definition? Um, so it, it would be how they define it, but you could arguably say it would. And I, I would say people talked about supporting products like uh, hair care products like Carol's Daughter or Miss Jessie's, which they sell at Target and Walmart, right? So, um, and people talked about going to, which I think at this moment is sort of interesting, they talked about supporting black directors, so they say, you know, I always go see Tyler Perry or Spike Lee movies, or I thought it was important to see Precious because, you know, it's important to support black um, film directors. So in some sense, that money's going to, um, what is it, MGM? Or I mean, it's not going, <laughs> you know, so when they're buying them theater ticket prices, I mean, they're buying the theater tickets or buying out theaters, you know, 
it's not necessarily supporting a black owned business. Is that right. gotcha. Um, uh, Kristen, would you call whoever? Yeah. See. Thanks, Cassie, for a wonderful presentation. So my, uh, hi, Casey, okay. my <laughs> question is to going back to education and thinking about that in relation to buying black. And I noticed, I think it was Tasha, that she uh, went to both an HBCU and Ivy League. And I was wondering if there's a tension there with um, wanting you know, or perceived tension with uh, seeking upward mobility and choosing where you spend your money on your education. Do you go to HBCU mm -hmm. or Ivy League? And is that like one of the concerns or one of the targets of buying black? And is that then something that trickles back into after you've gotten your degree? what if, you know that whole question yeah so I think this is a really interesting question I try to frame this as this is part of the sort of paradoxical position of being black and privileged right so they're making these decisions like should I uh, uh, should I go to HBCU or should I go to a predominantly white PWI institution right and that decision is actually I think uh, also indicative of their privileged position in some respects um, in terms of, I do ask them about do they give back to and um, would they recommend their uh, college to um, you know family members or other other folks? And I, I and I have to really sort of analyze that data um, in terms of like are individuals who go to HBCU more likely to give back? But uh, preliminarily, just speaking off the cusp, I I don't think that there was a um, a commitment to financially uh, give back more so for those who went to HBCUs than PWIs. And then a lot of people, again, like t not to say Tasha's example was um, emblematic of all, all of my respondents, but people do go to both institutions and they have, or even if they don't go to both types of institutions, they might have gone from an all white existence to a HBCU. Right, all white ed educational experience to HBCU. So they're, I think that also is more so what um, the, their black privilege gets at, that they are navigating these diverse cultural worlds. Um, and I feel like that is particularly unique to um, the black middle class. I don't know if that asks, answer your question. I know, I know where your question is coming from, but um, um, it is interesting to think about you know, to what degree is it important to support black cultural institutions, black educational institutions, um, and um, which have played such a huge role in um, creating opportunities for blacks to be upwardly mobile. Oh, can I go ahead? Oh, uh, Cassie, this is really interesting. Um, I have two questions. One around um, parental status or maybe age of the people in your uh, mm -hmm. sample. I wanted to know maybe how uh, sort of neighborhood uh, preference or consumption might change uh, or if you saw any of that revealed with people who've had kids and then maybe might prefer a black neighborhood but then might feel limited in terms of options with schooling. And then um, the other question was around whether any sort of theme emerged around sort of this idea that sort of like the white man's ice is colder or that thing in the sense mm. of concerns around uh, service with supporting black businesses. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll take your, the last question first. Um, so others have, uh, I feel like I've, um, even in the Ebony experience, the woman wrote a book about her experience and one of the things she talks about is how when she tried to get her family and friends to join along in her adventure, they were like, oh no, black owned uh, companies don't, um, they, they're unable to produce products of the same quality as a, as a white owned company or a white owned businesses are just better. It's this idea that is, that you're just gonna have a better experience, a better product or whatever. So I didn't really, um, people didn't explicitly say that, um, that there was this idea that, uh, you know, uh, white owned companies could produce better products. But I definitely, um, they definitely describe concerns about black owned businesses ability to compete and provide uh, products that they thought were of quality. So one person talks about, you know, I like supporting this black owned business, but man, they haven't updated their the website. Their website's from 1996, like they need to get it together. Um, 
So I do think that is one of the sort of challenges of actually um, implementing this idea of buying black in practice. But then again, black businesses arguably face penalties um, because of negative associations with, with blacks in general. So this, so um, the idea of white patrons not supporting a black owned business because it's black owned arguably means that black owned businesses are more reliant on black consumers for their, their, their patronage. Um, and if we look historically, black business districts, black main streets have been subject to racial violence, right? So black prosperity has been perceived as a threat. So that, those are sort of unique challenges that arguably black owned businesses might face um, which might limit their ability to provide the same types of services or products, right? So they're, they're operating from a position of, a challenged position sometimes. Um, I forgot your first question. Okay, and also about kids. So most of my respondents, my respondents were between the ages of 24 and 44. It was a younger demographic. And I purposely sampled a younger demographic in part because people's financial priorities shift as they age. Um, and I wanted to explore uh, individuals who, are, who were encumbered by certain um, sort of financial goals like retirement. Um, and so most of my respondents weren't parents. And so neighborhood um, school quality wasn't a factor. But there is research that indicates that um, middle class blacks still opt to live in black neighborhoods even when schools are of inferior quality because of the racial socialization for their children is, is, is more of a, which like Tasha talks about, black culture is celebrated and that's sort of important. But again, I think it is more so a matter of trade-offs because even if they opt to live in suburban neighborhoods, there's research on blacks who live in suburban neighborhoods who have to be hyper vigilant with regard to the experiences of their children in these um, you know, elite suburban schools. Um, so either way, I feel like um, there's a trade-off in terms of whether you attempt to optimize your class or you attempt to maximize on sort of the racial, cultural benefits of sort of neighborhood life. Um, and I think that trade-off isn't one that everyone faces. It's sort of is a challenge that results of having economic resources, which allows you to buy into progressively, arguably better neighborhoods. But in those neighborhoods, you might still experience um, negative experiences due to race. And, and I do have, there are, my sample is pretty much, um, there are a number, a significant portion of my sample didn't live in black neighborhoods. And one of the things that they talk about is, oh, my neighborhood has all these great amenities, but I'm also the only one. And uh, my neighbors sometimes say, you know, what's he doing here? How can he afford to live here? Or I feel like I don't fit in. Or when it comes time to go out, they have to, they don't go out in their neighborhoods. They meet up with their friends in other places. So either way, I feel like there's, there's definitely are trade-offs and, and managing that tension is really the unique uh, thing that middle class blacks have to do. Thank you for a very illuminating talk. Uh, I, my question regar is regarding um, buying black and the, the desire to support community. It seems that a lot of the respondents wanted to support their the community. I guess my question is two part. One, do you think that it, a lot of that is uh, geographically local? And if so, mm -hmm. do you have any sense for what the current ways of gentrification have done to places like uh, uh, Harlem and uh, mm -hmm. let's say the Crenshaw District in Los Angeles in terms of the displacement of black businesses and what that means in terms of su supporting the community? Mm -hmm. Um, that's a really great question, and I, unfortunately, I can't really speak to um, whether or not um, uh, sort of black businesses have been displaced as neighborhoods have changed. I do think there is there is interesting ways in which new businesses try to capitalize on black culture. So, um, in places like Harlem and um, in in other sort of iconic black neighborhoods there are you know all these restaurants and coffee shops that are you know named the frederick or um, harriet tubman cafe you know there's definitely a way in which black culture is um being utilized 
in those spaces who, and, and the ownership might necessarily um, reflect the community or at least the historic community. Um, but I do think that that's probably an area of, of research that, that should be explored. Uh, what are the sort of the um, consequences and implications for this demographic shift of neighborhoods uh, considering, um, you know, how does it have an impact on the commercial districts and the type of services and amenities that are provided that might have traditionally, you know, served or catered to black clientele. I would argue that, I would think, I would hypothesize that eventually those businesses would, would be displaced if there's not enough patrons to support them and also if the demographic sh uh, shift of neighborhoods is such that um, they uh, don't demand those types of goods or services. So I, I, I interviewed a subsample of non-blacks, so whites and Asians who lived in black neighborhoods. And one of the things that I thought was interesting is that they themselves had concern about these sort of neighborhood institutions and their ability to remain in the neighborhood. Um, but at the same time, they were eager for the neighborhood to change in terms of the type of amenities that existed. So. Okay, all four parts. So, um, <laughs> so, okay, I can't really speak to the sort of Asian middle class or maybe the Indian middle class in part because I don't research them. But I do think that is a really interesting empirical question. And we, as we move to um, an increasingly diverse nation, a majority minority nation, I think it is going to be important to sort of distill how these different ethnic enclave communities and in some sense, they may not be a part of ethnic enclave, just a, a different ethnicity, engage in the market, right? Um, and I do think um, that there probably are a lot of similarities, but there may also be some points of distinction. 
um, in terms of larger scale black owned businesses. So some of the um, most profitable black owned businesses are car dealerships and um, you know, arguably they're not, they're located in certain geographic areas. Um, but there are black industrial businesses or commercial businesses and um, people didn't mention them. They weren't very salient, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but they did talk about, there were respondents who talked about going to black doctors or black dentists, black lawyers, black bankers, um, and black realtors. So this idea of, of providing, of, of patronizing uh, black professional service providers was something that was mentioned. And there is research on health disparities that indicates how having a black doctor for a black person might be um, <laughs> critical for your life. <laughs> so, you know, this idea of, of, of black professionals, seeking out black professional service providers might be important. Um, um, in my research on mortgage lending, you know, that it might be important to think about um, and, and, and patronize black service providers in terms of getting access to uh, good health care or gaining access to fair treatment in the marketplace. Um, and there's lots of research on how middle class blacks have been um, discriminated even though their credit profiles should deem them worthy to qualify for mortgage loans, right? So maybe that is a, a means of, dip, of, 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 it would be arguably an avenue to gain access and or better treatment. But um, it wasn't highly salient, but it was mentioned. Um, in terms of there being a certain threshold of economic resources that um, would guarantee you better treatment. Um, so this idea of, of you know, uh, black millionaires would race be less salient with their class advantages, um, you know, allow them to, to uh, be free of some of the burdens. Um, I, I don't research black millionaires, but I would suggest, um, and one of the things I talk about is, you know, this idea of retail racism, you know, countless examples of very powerful black elite multimillionaires from Oprah Winfrey to President Obama talk about having encounters in retail settings where they're treated dis discriminatorily. So arguably, it doesn't necessarily, uh, you might still encounter class misrecognition and race might be the primary marker that is assessed in determining whether you are worthy as a client to be served. Um, so um, while I don't research black multimillionaires, I would suspect that um, you wouldn't be able to discern their black multimillionaire when they walk into a shop, and that doesn't mean that they would be guaranteed um, priority or preferential treatment. But it arguably would have a huge impact on their lifestyles, and their lifestyles might be very much adjacent to other millionaires and very different than the black middle class or the black working class or the black poor. Um, so I, I hope that kind of addressed your, your sort of last question about racial consciousness versus class consciousness. Thank you, Cassie. Great. Okay, good. I'm glad. Yeah. I wasn't sure. That was all sort of the new work. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hi. How are you? <laughs>